Good afternoon to our viewers in Europe and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to our series, Resilience and Adaptation, brought to you by 1014 and the ACG. Today, we kick off our fall season of joint events by looking at the future, but what can we even predict about what lies ahead in these uncertain times? And I'm Katja Donovan, Chief Officer at 1014. Twice a month, we will be joined by experts and practitioners from both sides of the Atlantic to talk about the challenges and opportunities our societies are facing during the current public health, economic, and social crisis. Predicting the future is difficult, and even more so during this period of unprecedented uncertainty. One thing, though, is for sure. The pandemic has changed the lives of billions of people all over the globe. But what are the lasting changes and what will vanish again? Joining us today to talk about the future and today are Maria Bothwell and Gerd Leonhardt, both of whom have been influenced by the well-known futurist Alvin Toffler, an American writer, futurist, and businessman known for his focus on the impact of modern technologies on society including the digital rev revolution and the communication revolution. 50 years ago, in 1970, his first major book about the future, titled Future Shock, became an international bestseller. I'm delighted to welcome Maria Bothwell, the COO of Toffler Associates, a future-focused strategic advisory firm which was founded by Alvin Toffler. Before joining Toffler Associates, Maria was a managing director at North Highland, overseeing media, entertainment, and the communications industry. Her prior experience includes management consulting with Arthur Anderson and Ernst & Young. She studied industrial engineering and operations research and holds an MBA. Maria, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Gerd Leonhardt, is a European futurist, speaker, filmmaker, and author who focuses on the nexus of humanity and technology. He is the CEO of the Futures Agency in Zurich. Gerd studied theology at the University of Bonn and music at the Berklee College of Music. He had a first career as a professional musician and composer. Influenced by futurists such as Alvin Toffler, Gerd Leonhardt developed his futurist practice with an emphasis on the European tradition of humanist values and philosophy. Herzlich willkommen, Gerd. Thank you, thank you. Nicely said. <laughs> We'd like to remind everybody that the ACG and 1014 are both independent, nonpartisan organizations. The views expressed during this conversation are those of our two experts. Also, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function on Zoom or send an email to sokol at acgusa.org and we'll do our best to integrate your questions into the conversation. Predicting the future, working as a futurist, almost has a magical ring. But I assume we're very much misled if we think about crystal balls or stacks of cards. Maria, as the CEO of a future-oriented strategic advisory firm, you work with clients to understand uncertain futures and make decisions today. How do you think about and understand uncertainty? Hi. Uh, so at Toffler Associates, you know, we, our methodology is guided by Alvin and Heidi Toffler. Um, they were our original teachers and how to think about the future. And uh, a lot of their practice has been through um, – uh, observation, learning, talking to as many different people with different backgrounds as possible, experts in their fields, but also um, um, everyday people. Uh, we really try to hone our clients down to what questions are they trying to answer so about the future. So, you know, some examples might include uh, what are domestic disruptions in 2030 or what is the future of a digital society in 2030. So the questions may, uh, will narrow the research and observations. And um, we really try to think through multiple dimensions. Uh, and uh, again, through, through Alvin Toffler's teachings, we, we really look at what we call six spheres. 
um, getting into the psychosphere um, about the human psyche and what causes an uh, individual to behave, technology, technosphere, um, the information and infosphere, biosphere, which is all about the environment and sociosphere. But being able to do that and look at it in those multiple dimensions causes us to ask new questions and explore different avenues that aren't so traditional. Um, and, and really the big thing is, is not trying to predict and, and just look at trends, but trying to imagine um, what, what might these futures be like and what is influencing. Uh, what are those drivers of change? What are influencing the environment around us? Yeah, is that the way uh, you work too? Or what, what's your take? How do you, how do you approach well, mm -hmm. the future? Well, it is, it is, I think it's very similar because, you know, obviously we're both influenced by the same direction. And, <laughs> and if you're looking back to the, great, to the great futurists of the past, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, Bucky Fullminster, Buckminster Fuller, sorry, <laughs> Buckminster Fuller, and everybody in that direction. I mean, it's, I think it's quite clear there's, for me, there's no such thing as predicting the future. Um, I think it's really about, I call that future observation. And this is what you do when you pay attention. Uh, it's really that simple. So you pay attention to what happens around you. You'd look at what is likely to happen. And, the, and then you have this sort of intuition that emerges, right? Like a hunch. Like, you know, in 1999, I said, uh, I was in the music business and I said, okay, music is going to move into the cloud because, you know, this is perfectly suited for the cloud and it makes perfect sense. And everybody hated me, right? And I wrote my first book, Music Like Water, uh, the whole the future of music. And, and what do we have today? Well, music is in the cloud. And that was really clear 20 years ago uh, to those that were looking. Right? So all you have to look uh, to do is to look and to listen and to observe, and I think that's my approach to the, to the job. So I guess Katya has, has frozen for a moment, so let me um, <laughs> dive in. Um, pandemics have plagued civilizations for centuries, um, and on some levels, the, the COVID-19 pandemic seemed to be unprecedented. It, it, it certainly was unanticipated by many people. But we suddenly find ourselves in a, in a new environment. And I guess my, my question to both of you would be, did either of you predict something like COVID-19? So I can, I can share with you... Um, our perspective. So it's hard to say you can predict something like COVID-19, but, but based on studying history, pandemics have affected humanity throughout history. So you know they're going to impact again. And really since the early 2000s, we have included pandemics, global pandemics in our scenarios um, that we do with clients, our future scenarios. Um, similar to we also include, included major space weather events like a Carrington event um, or other major um, uh, volatile weather environments that impact infrastructure. All of these also impact humanity. So, so again, looking at history, we know these things are going to occur again. So it's logical to include them in future scenarios. Um, I, that's different than a prediction. I think um, one of the things that um, you know, is fascinating about right now and this year, and, and it's extraordinary. I mean, this is not something anyone could have predicted, but um, it's not just a global pandemic that has impacted every continent, um, but we've, we've surfaced supply chain vulnerabilities, you know, after decades of trying to optimize supply chains, um, and, and that's going to, you know, cause dramatic change. Um, the, the pandemic sparked an economic crisis. Uh, that has resulted in significant job loss. Um, and what many people call greater than the 2008 uh, recession. Um, we've highlighted and surfaced uh, things that we've known are problems, but now they're, they're clear in front of everybody, but equity disparities in healthcare and education uh, and social justice. Um, this has driven societal disruptions um, that you know, would not have been expected just by a pandemic alone. It's coincided with massive weather events, the fires out west in the U.S., the hurricanes down south. And then you, you add all that up in a contentious election year in the United States, 
Um, it, it is absolutely extraordinary. And I think one thing that we will see is in future scenarios, again, not predictions, but in future scenarios and planning that organizations will do, um, the, the layers of complexity added into those scenarios, this is, this is you know, setting a new history lesson for us to use for future scenarios and crisis planning. So we will, yeah. we will obviously come back to a number of the issues that, that you just touched on. I mean, I think one of the things that, that I find um, is how palpable the feeling of uncertainty is that people have at this moment because of all of the issues that you just, just outlined. Um, but before diving into those topics, Garrett, I'd like to come back to you and, and ask, you know, you've been following trends um, in Europe and around the world. Um, could, could you, did you foresee um, a pandemic um, on a global scale like this one? Uh, I could say for myself and for people that work with me uh, at the Futures Agency, I mean, I, I didn't. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't foresee Donald Trump winning the election. Uh, in fact, I was betting against it in every possible way. Uh, I didn't foresee the Brexit uh, because my view on this is, you know, there are events like this that are uh, out of left field to a large degree, even though you can't really say that about the pandemic. You know, there have been quite a few brilliant people like Larry Brilliant, fits his name, and Bill Gates, who have been saying that this is going to happen for you. Everybody know, knew this was coming. Nobody wanted to get prepared because it would have required shifting of resources. Yeah, so this was clear, and we finally got up. You know, now we know it, it was real, and we're in a similar situation about climate change, even though it's further away, and about artificial general intelligence. Yeah? So we know that machines are going to become, I wouldn't say conscious, you know, but they will get there in the convergence 2050, as Ray Kurzweil said, and. We can choose not to do anything and just kind of run into it, or we can prepare. And now we know, I think this is something we've learned in the crisis, you know? If we have clear signs and intuitions and great people talking about it, we got to use our intuition to prepare for what could happen and to be ready. And now we know that, you know, the healthcare system around the world is going to get trillions of dollars now uh, to, to, uh, to be bolstered for the future. But I didn't really think of that as possible as it was. And, and, you know, for one thing, it has kind of wiped out my entire business, right, of giving keynote speeches. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, I, I used to travel 750,000 miles a year, uh, 100 times a year, speaking to thousands of people every, every week. And, and now I'm here looking at the camera. So it's really quite a different world. And I think we're all in the same boat, is that we all have to pivot. You know, everybody has to say, okay, doesn't work anymore. What do we do now? <laughs> and... Um, as I was saying earlier, I think the thing about the future and um, this issue of predictions, it's really much more about intuition, about foresight, about feeling something strongly. Like, like I've been saying for years, you know, the end of oil is coming. Right? And I don't really know why. I can't really prove to you conclusively that, that this is the case. It's just something I feel. And I didn't feel that about the pandemic. I have to say that I didn't have the hunch on the pandemic in the same way. But perhaps one way of looking at it is, is many people knew that something like this was coming. Um, if, if one thinks about the kinds of, of scenarios that Maria was talking about, a pandemic, particularly after something like SARS or Ebola um, or you know, other diseases that have emanated on one continent and, and traveled to other continents, this is not something new. This is, this is a, a trend that some people saw coming. We just didn't know when. Similarly, we know that COVID-19 will end. We just don't know exactly when or how. Um, and I think what we would like to you know, unpack a little bit today is, is what might the world look like as we emerge from the, the current pandemic? Um, and so, you know, one of the questions I have for, for both of you is how might society change? How might human behavior change either during this pandemic um, or as a result of the pandemic? Maria, you, you talked about the current state or described the current state as the great weight. Mm -hmm. um, I know from a lot of people that they hate the term the new normal 
and that they feel like we're not in a new normal. We're not. You, you said that we were heading toward the novel normal. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of this period of time, this yeah. great wait, this limbo that we're in? Um, and then, then Garrett, we'd like to get your perspectives yeah. on that as well. Yeah, so, so based on studying past pandemics and response um, to major crises, we, we see four stages. Um, the acute response phase, which we're through, sort of the first three to six months, the shock and awe, the, um, um, that's left us with unbelievably high unemployment rates. It's left us with new technology infrastructure in our organizations and our homes. Um, we are now in the great wait, uh, which we see can last anywhere from you know, three to 30 months. Um, hopefully, if, if predictions around vaccination availability around the globe are true, maybe that means it will only last through 2021. But this is where new, new behaviors are being learned and um, codified. Um, we are, um, we're trying to balance health, safety, and economic activity. Um, there's the, the anxiety that goes along with the unknown. Um, and, and that's where we are right now. Um, once the vaccination is available globally to the mass market, um, and we will enter what we call the reunite and revitalize stage. And, and this is where, you know, organizations um, will come back together, families and communities will come back together in the flesh, which will be nice and wonderful. Um, we will see that recovery of economic as well as social recovery. Um, we'll also start seeing the lasting challenges. Maybe they be in health, mental health, that we're going to be living with for a long time because of this. Um, um, we will at, at some point um, reach what we do call the stage of the novel normal. Uh, so not the new normal, but the novel normal. Um, and this, this really is where we're feeling a sense of, of economic stability. And this stage may go on for years, but really until the next big global event occurs um, that sends us back through the cycle. Um, I, 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 will, I will come back to some of the longer term implications because we've got, we've got a lot to talk about. But I do think the thing that we need to think about a major driver of what's going to be driving some of those changes is how long are we in this great wait? And, um, and what's happening because of it? What types of uh, innovation is happening in business and even in our personal lives? Um, you know, we're doing different creative ways to interact with friends and family. You know, do those things stay? The longer we do them, the more they become habit. Um, but what we do know is what will not change is our need for human contact. And video does not, you know, take the place of an in-person hug. So, um, so those things will, will come back but, but uh, we've, we will still have new habits formed from it that will last for years. Yeah, you know, it's, Garrett, it's, you, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, we are essentially in the, uh, in the era of time where the meaning of the world normal uh, ceases to exist. It has become kind of a useless word, you know? Um, yeah. So basically this was already kind of happening before COVID because of exponential technological change, right? But, but now it's, very, it's almost impossible to say what is normal and what was normal and what should be normal. But I think as, um, as, as Joe Biden says, you know, a better normal is what we want. Right? So we're now moving in a time where it's almost impossible to say what, uh, what a normal could be. I just know that for me, the result of the crisis right now is already four things, right? Or five. It's big tech, uh, technology is everywhere. Uh, big health, of course, clearly so. Uh, big media, so we're all watching, we're all communicating, we're all going virtual. Um, big state, right? The state is putting its fingers everywhere, uh, and you know, whether it's the helicopter money or the, the state subsidy or whatever, and big green. Right? And I think really what is happening now is that, especially with millennials, you know, like my son is around 30, so he, he fits very well in there. For them, it's a mental reset of the narrative. You know, it's like, for my father, World War II. You know, it's like they went through it, but it was a total reset of the, of the narrative. And for them, it's, I think it's a lot like they're going to say, well, now we're going to question things more. And if we could compromise in a, 
in the time of COVID, can we compromise for carbon tax uh, and the climate change? And if we can question politicians because they were lousy in times of COVID, can we, can we question them because they're lousy with equality? Right? Uh, and, and so we're now moving into a new paradigm and that story is different. And I think this is why this is a decisive opportunity as Klaus Schwab says from the World Economic Forum, right? This is a, I call this the great transformation and he calls it the great reset, you know, same thing. This is an opportunity for us to say, you know what? Didn't work before, definitely didn't work in the crisis. Got to work different in the future. Yeah. And what is that? Yeah. How could it work better in the future? And the topmost question, what kind of leaders do we need? Because we're going to have, in my view, four waves of challenges. There's COVID. There's a recession after COVID. That's at least two or three years. L-shape, right? There is climate change, right, along with COVID and after COVID, as we're all seeing right now in California. And there's fourth, the convergence of humans and machines. AGI, singularity. And these are amazing opportunities as well. They're not all just challenges, right? But we've got to get on, the, on with the program and have answers and not just go on, you know, business as usual is finished. That's pretty much the, Garrett, let me, the crisis let me has push you on, on one, let me, Garrett, let me push you on one thing that, that you've brought up because it's come up a couple of times, um, this, this notion about how important the climate is. I mean, everything that both of you have, have talked about is, is important. Um, on the one hand, I think one's recognizing a, a greater awareness about climate change um, during this, this COVID period. And certainly one of the issues, Garrett, that you focused on is a, a, a renewed focus on, on dealing with, with climate um, and, and uh, that policymakers and all of us as human beings need to focus on it a little bit more. Do you think, and this is a question for both of you, but, but let's start with Garrett, do you think that there's greater awareness around the climate crisis today than there was a year ago and that COVID has, has contributed to that? Well, you know, COVID-19, I think, is a test run for climate change. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's appalling to think of it that way because already it's already bad enough, you know, when you think about all the things that are happening. But really what's happening is that we're making sacrifices, we're changing our lives, we're being economically impacted, privately impacted. You take the same thing, X1000, you, you have the challenge of global warming. Right? It's just that people will not be dying on our doorstep next week, you know. They'll be dying on our, on our borders in 10 years, right? So we tend to say, well, you know, that's still a lot of time, you know, let's go fly to Corsica for the weekend. So we, we still have the same mindset. And I really believe that what the crisis has proven now is that we have to tackle what's not already here. Right? And of course, that's our job, right, is to, is to help with that mission. We must take a look and say, you know, we, we cannot always just live by reacting to what is happening. Yeah because we will not survive this, right? We, will, we are gonna survive COVID. Right? Uh, maybe we'll, we would survive the, uh, the revolution of the robots, I don't know. But climate change, yeah, 40 years, the numbers are clear, right? Yeah. So, and, and this is, I think the people are ready now to say, you know what, if it takes dramatic action, like during the times of COVID, you know, whether it's quarantines or lockdowns, we got to take this action now. And people are willing. I think. Yeah. In addition to what Gerd say, which I, I agree with everything, I'll add um, an optimistic viewpoint. Um, I do think people are more aware of the changes. The, the, just that first month in lockdown and, and seeing the skies clear and, and when there was less traffic, you know, that made it clear um, that there is a connection between our human behavior and the environment. I also, I, I'm very optimistic that this race for discovery of a vaccination and a cure to COVID and to get, you know, society back into a more stable state um, is highlighting to youngsters uh, and in um, and, and much of society the importance of science and the need for science. Um, and, and how that will contribute to our advancement as, you know, humans. And what my hopeful optimism is, is that with that um, science being put on a pedestal to solve this global pandemic, that that will also encourage 
uh, you know, young students to enter STEM fields and study and, and believe in the environmental science that's out there. And so not just science around health, but, but science and other facets of our life. And that science will become king again. Um, and that's, that's my optimistic hope is that, the, that not just adults are being influenced, but youngsters are being influenced to go into those fields because they're seeing the importance of science and finding a vaccination. Uh, Ed, let me add a mirror to this. Um, you know, the importance of science clearly is now magnified, right? Uh, and despite of what most of the people in the American government think, you know, science does have the, a lot of answers for this. But the flip side of that is also that people are saying that humans and humanity and solidarity and compassion are also rising in importance. You know, see what happened in Europe, for example, is that we, we said we would never have helped the Italians. You know, the German or the Dutch, they all said, you know, we we're going to give free money to the Italians and the Spanish and the Greek, and that's not going to happen. That's been Merkel's story for, for a decade. All of a sudden, they say, you know what, if we don't show solidarity and we have this huge, uh, 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 the stimulus package of, I don't what is it, 2.1 trillion or so, it's gigantic, right? If we don't have that, let's break the rules. Let's doesn't matter. Let's go forward. So it's both science and humanity that has taken a boost in this crisis. And I think that's really important to realize, you know, that the answer to the future, as I like to say, technology gives us all the tools and science, but we must have the will. Yeah. And we must have the policy. And the policy is what's been getting a boost in this crisis. By saying, you know what, if we don't collaborate, it's going to be dark for us. And it's forcing us to look at this yeah. issue and say basically unconditional solidarity. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much what's happening, even though most people would hate the idea of unconditional anything. Uh, but this is really what we're doing right now. Yeah. I, I also think it's, it's highlighting the interconnectedness and second and tertiary effects of policy decisions. Um, people are becoming more aware that it's not so simple of cause and effect you know, a policy cause effect and then you solve a problem, that, that there's so many um, interconnections and, and complexities that, that have to be thought through. And, and to think through them, you need different perspectives. Um, it can't just be sort of the typical policymaker making the decision, but there needs to be um, true representation in, in helping solve that problem and providing the input. Um, so whether it be climate related or social justice related, yeah, and, and, you know, look at what happened in the crisis. It's become so clear what works and what doesn't. Uh, and interestingly enough, in terms of policy, the countries with female leaders, women leaders, and the countries where people trust their government, they're doing great, right? New Zealand, yeah. Switzerland, Taiwan, Finland, Iceland, Norway. Uh, I mean, the, the story goes on, right? And the countries that have uh, extreme capitalism and have a bunch of uh, clueless older guys, you know, America, Brazil, UK, South Africa, uh, you know, can't put them on the same pot. But, you know, they're not doing so great. And why is that? You know, why is that? I think it's because the style of leadership is not suited to this, yeah. the world that is moving in hyperdrive into the future. Yeah. That, that just all reminds me of what you said earlier, uh, Gerd, that, that you said, well, uh, can we even talk about the normal? You know, when you say, okay, humanity, science, interconnections, different perspective, we're all faced all of a sudden, you know, pretty much all of a sudden with a totally different outlook on, on what's going on. And I just, just would be curious before we dig into the big tech, big media, big health, you know, big state. Um, so how do you, um, you know, don't people crave a normal? And, you know, when, yeah, when you know, you're saying, when you take that away, how do you get them out of their comfort zone, you know, in your work? Well, you, you say, okay, you, know, you, you, you really need to, to look at things in a different way. You know, the, the important part in my work has been emerging in the last five years is we have to stop asking the question, you know, what does the future bring? You know, that question is just ridiculous because the answer to that is it could bring anything that we want because... In, in 10 years, in 20 years, we'll be infinitely powerful with technology. We can upload our brain to the internet or we can take a shuttle to Mars. You know, that's not 100 years away. That's only like the lifetime of my kids, right? So the question is not what will the future bring as if it was invented somewhere like Silicon Valley or China. You know, the question is what future do we want, right? Which choices are we going to make? 
Mm -hmm. uh, if, let, let's assume we're going to have pretty much all the tools we could ever want to have in 20 years, which is quite likely, you know, quantum computing and so on and so on. And then we have to say, well, is it going to be good for us to upload our brain to the internet? Right. Are we going to have, uh, a, a, you know, huge longevity, live forever? Is that a good thing? You know, and, who's, and who is going to decide? And so those are the real questions when, when you talk about the future not what we can have, but we want to have, you know, our preferred future, as Alvin used to say also, uh, you know, what future do we want to actually generate? Right. Do you agree with that, Maria? Or? Um, yes, and in fact, you know, when we're, when we're working with clients and we're exploring um, different plausible possible future scenarios that maybe 10, 15 years out, you know, one of the big things that we focus on is understanding what are some of the common denominators? What do we want to create in that? What do we want to try to drive to happen and how can we influence that along the way as well? So not just building resiliency and preparedness for those various future scenarios, um, that's a critical part of it, but it's also what are the things that we can influence along that path? Um, so yes, I do, I do agree with Garrett from that standpoint. And, and this is the hard part, you know, because uh, I can tell you so many times when, when, when we meet with clients, I say, you know what, we just want an answer. It's like you go to the doctor and you get an injection yeah. because you have a pain, you know, but, but it doesn't help you. It, it just fixes the pain until next week. <laughs> so my approach is to say, you know what, I'm not going to give you an answer. You know, I'm like a therapist. I'm going to look for you to discover the answer and what we're discussing. Uh, because, because almost every answer I would give you would be patently wrong because I'm not you, you know? It's like, this is a discovery process. And so in, in this idea of, um, of, have, of creating your preferred future, you don't have to look very far to see the most successful people operating on this paradigm. And this would be Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and Tim Cook and you know, the tech industry, right? They are saying, you know what, let's get a good intuition and then this is the world that we want to have, right? Uh, and it's not always a good thing, that's for sure. But uh, different discussions. So I, I think this is the, the wrong approach that people think about the future. It's like, what's going to happen and how can I be part of it, right? Well, you're but a part when, of it regardless of what you do. When you think about what, what can happen, how can you be part of it, uh, what's, how, what's your preferred future, uh, get you before you said, you know, big government, you know, do do government regulations become acceptable now that we've sort of experienced a pandemic we you know we're facing climate change and the climate crisis do do people become more willing sort of to say okay you know i'm, I'm going to accept regulations for business for myself sort of because there's a need um for a broader cooperation like you know broader guideline uh sort of to to get this under control because nature evidently cannot be really controlled well, it's quite clear that, you know, the role of government is to mediate between science and technology and the industry uh, and people, right? It's basically, let's put this all in one bucket, right, over here, science, technology, and industry, and then people and society over here, right? Uh, and government's role is to say, you know, there, there has to be a balance between the two. And clearly what is happening now is I think the answer is that uh, our current economic system, which is, you know, corporate capitalism in America, uh, and the notion of profit and growth is totally unsuitable for the future because it completely answers the wrong questions. <laughs> you know, we're go we have to go beyond GDP if we want to prosper in the future. Uh, and we're seeing that with this crisis, this is not about money, right? Uh, money ha can provide the answers, but you know, climate change, recession, artificial intelligence, uh, all this coming in succession. Now we have to say, well, well what is the role of government is to make sure that we can be prepared and do all this. And this will be decidedly non-market at times, right? I mean, and this is a bizarre thing because we found that there is no real alternative to capitalism uh, in history, right? But now we're here, we're saying, you know, if we just follow the path of capitalism, we will never solve these problems, just like we have not solved media by inventing Facebook, you know? We've, we've invented a monster in, in return. So, so if we want to solve what's going to happen with climate change, it's going to have to be done by government, yeah, I would say wisdom, if you can say any such thing. Um, and intervention, for example, with carbon taxes. You know, if you have to pay a carbon tax for every flight you're taking, it would be a pain, especially for me. But it's insurmountable. It's going to happen. 
right? And can that happen in a free market? Never. Nobody pays a tax voluntarily. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least not here. Maybe in China they would, you know, because that's different. But and, and this is the challenge, right? This is basically to break these problems. We need to involve state and government and uh, leaders in an entirely new way. I would add a few things. I, I, in, you know, my perspective is U.S. centric, so I apologize about that to those that are not from the U.S. on the call. Um, there, we, we've been in a trust recession before COVID. Uh, with this pandemic, depending on how local governments um, responded, as well as organizations responded to the pandemic, that has either increased or decreased trust. So, so, but as a whole, there continues to be trust erosion in our society. Um, we, we are also now battling the, uh, you know, further issues of privacy. Again, data privacy and privacy were issues before the pandemic. Now it's gotten to our personal health data and um, that conflict or, or um, challenge between, you know, my personal health data or, or my health behavior and how does that intersect with uh, the community, my my company that I work with, um, my clients, the government that supports me, um, and access to that data. Um, so health status enters the trust equation, and that it raises new questions around privacy. Um, so so these are going to continue to evolve um, greater friction. Um, I do I agree with Garrett that you know there we are at a a social responsibility moment with our organization. So corporations, um, institutions, governments, you know, the public has um, transparency into the true character of an organization or institutions based on the decisions they've made uh, and how are they treating their employees or the community around them. Uh, it, just think about it from an organization's response to COVID, you know, current and future employees, as well as current and future customers, uh, can evaluate the organization based on their response. Um, so, so organizations and governments also have the opportunity to support uh, the community or, or their employees. And this may come in the role of a safety net, you know, with added um, sick days or financial assistance um, or adjusted hours to accommodate, you know, kids learning at home. And we're not. And, and, and these are, you know, these are uh, sort of going to be laying the groundwork into what does the public look at for its organizations and institutions and governments. And, and, and I believe there's going to be an outcry for accountability it, that's very different than what we've seen in the past, both, uh, again, to government as well as organizations and um, in, institutions on transparency and accountability. Yeah, I mean, COVID is a giant accelerator, right? And, and you can say that basically what's happening, what was latent and kind of already there has been accelerated. Uh, and some of the things were good and some were bad, but it's like, it's like a warp drive into the same thing, but further, right? So for example, inequality, right? very big problem in the US and in, and in Brazil also. Uh, and it's, it has resulted in the simple fact that if you're black or brown, you're more likely to get infected, right? And uh, if you're a low income earner, you're likely to lose your job in COVID. And it's totally polarized on this, right? Uh, and, and so inequality has been a booster for the virus. You know? While here in Switzerland, it's the reverse. You know, people, Swiss people are very like, you know, we vote every three months for some piddly little things, but also big things. Um, and then we trust the government, right? Because we don't have CEOs in the government. You know, we, have, we don't have a prime minister. We have uh, seven different prime ministers, so to speak, right? Uh, and basically what happened here in Switzerland is people said, the government is doing a good job, let's trust them and do what they say. And in Italy they said, oh, the government is corrupt, let's not do ever what they say, right? And the outcome is disaster, right? So the issue of trust is a huge issue now in, in society mm -hmm. and it's very I, polarized I now. Perhaps I'd like to fold in a, a viewer question um, that helps us make the segue from, from what we've been talking about to talk a little bit about the economy as well. Um, and this is, why would someone believe that big government can respond to current challenges as well as the free market and private sector? This seems to be an ideological posture that ignores experience. 
Do either of you yeah, want I, to try to take? I agree. <laughs> I agree with that statement. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm using I'm using the word big gov uh, as as a joke because it fits with big media and big tech and so on. I'm not right. I'm not proposing big gov yeah. as a solution. I'm just saying this is an analysis right now. The state is very big right now. Right? I don't think big government or big state is the answer to our problems. Uh, this is just the analogy of the current analysis, right? I think what I really mean to say is that the role of government and state uh, needs to be to guide us forward into a pretty complex future, completely different than it has been so far. Uh, and trusting the government is becoming a major thing uh, because the government will tell us to do things that we don't like, like the carbon tax or the meat tax or whatever you want to you know, add to that agenda, you know, um, and then and then we're going to rewrite capitalism. That's you know what Al Gore called sustainable capitalism. And so I'm not at all proposing big government. I'm, I'm actually completely not on that agenda. Right? Um, but I do think we need powerful leadership. And if you look into a good combination of how that has been done until now, it's New Zealand. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the, the picture book story of how that can be done. It's not big government in the in the sense of George Orwell or pre Reagan. You know, it's 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 powerful, intuitive, and capable government. Well, and it's showing, as you said, it's showing leadership and and having everybody do their bit. Um, I'd like to try to pull together a couple themes um, and and pick up on a couple points that each of you have made. Uh, Maria, you you talked earlier briefly about the disruption of supply chains as a result of the pandemic. Garrett, you've you've touched on artificial intelligence, but also on the future of work, and and you've both talked a little bit about how the economy and how business might change. Um, do you think that this is a moment that might lead to more sustainable economic business models? I, I do believe we are in, in probably the longer we're in this great weight state um, that it's going to continue to drive innovation and creativity. And so therefore new digital models, um, um, ways to deliver frictionless services or product to consumers, we're going to see more of that. Um, so, so whether that creates more stability or not, you know, I, I, I would think it will because it's business models transitioning into this environment that is different and adapting to it as well as consumer behavior and expectations changing as in, in causing, you know, either responding to those new services or actually driving and instigating those new services. So, so I, I, believe it, it can. Um, I, I think just, you know, think of the simple examples of, you know, restaurants creating cafes on the top of parking garages. You know, who would have thought of that, you know, six months ago? And, and now that's, you know, a way to serve the community and, and a way to drive, you know, economic activity for that restaurant and the workers of that restaurant. Um, so, so that's something we would have never thought of that in, in that's just a little tiny example, but, but to me, it's a, a pleasurable example that we can all hopefully enjoy at some point. Um, I also think, um, when we think of, uh, the future of work, you know, there is this interim time in the great way that, that, that thing, that work is adapting, um, organizations have expanded their network security to include homes. You know, that's something that would not have occurred because of this. There's been quite a bit of investment in that infrastructure. There will continue to be investment in that infrastructure from a security standpoint, or there should, um, because obviously that's a vulnerable place right now and will continue to be a vulnerable place until, until that's invested on. And in that, that's another place where I expect us to see some continued innovation. Um, I think that's also going to drive more um, some changes in, in, in work. You know, we're, we've already adapted working hours and schedules. Um, um, the, the, the concept of going back to a five-day commuting schedule is just probably unheard of. People are realizing the value of an extra hour. Um, I think I, I read a study recently that um, on average, there's an additional 50 minutes of productivity a day by, by the workforce. Um, so companies aren't going to want to give that up either and trade that for commuting. So um, there are, there are again, new, there are behaviors and 
habits that we are doing now that are forming that are going to be longer term, it doesn't mean we're going to be in a 100% teleworking environment um, long term, but some hybrid environment uh, where there's um, online collaboration as well as uh, as well as in-person collaboration happening throughout, you know, the weeks and months. Um, I think new job, you know, job um, um, arrangements are being formed today that aren't going to go away either. Um, in response to this, and that might be, you know, the the contract term, um, the benefits, or what what might be necess a necessity today will become a benefit later. Um, like again, the ability to work remotely, whether that be at your home or at a, you know, on vacation or in a different country. And Gary, yeah, what yeah. about you? I think well, there's three points really. One is about the externalities, you know, that this basically the whole story of, of business has been for a long time, especially because of uh, the internet society and the digital society is that whatever is external to our business model, we don't take care of because somebody else will uh, like, like it has been the fossil fuel business. So Facebook does not take care of externalities because, you know, we are sitting there with a disastrous result of manipulation and mm -hmm. Facebook just keeps earning money. So this has been the business model. Like, you know, you don't care about externalities, but now we're saying, you know what, there are externalities like this pandemic uh, that's impacting everyone. And that is becoming the new business model. It's this sort of stakeholder economy, right? That has been discussed that we need to take care of all the points of the food chain. Uh, yeah. And this is, this is becoming the new normal, right? Um, the second one, I think as uh, CEO, uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadea said, we've had more digital transformation in the last three months than we had in the previous three years. Right? Uh, and that's so true. You know, now you have your my 75 year old neighbor. He is, he is ordering food on Uber Eats and he didn't even know what Uber was before. He was hardly using his phone for anything but making phone calls, right? And, and, and now our narrative is changing. We're saying, you know what, um, do I really have to go there, you know, for a one day meeting of Beijing? I, you know, mm -hmm. I go in the holographic room, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and basically what seemed totally impossible before it's kind of like, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> it's like, and this is going to continue. And I think this recession is an L-shaped recession, which means uh, McKinsey's study latest one shows at the end of 2021, we're going to see a recovery in China and US, maybe uh, Canada and so on in Europe in 22. It's like this. And then hopefully, you know, unknown afterwards. But um, Joe Biden again talks about the K-shaped recession. It's going to be great for the rich people disastrous for this for the poor people like this you know like a k could also be an option but anyway because of that i really think that uh this this process will be something that will bring up many many basic questions right? and fundamental challenges to our the way that we think about the world right? so our paradigm is changing and it's quite clear if we look at profit and growth and jobs um then we're not going to be capable of dealing with these crises as they come. Right? And that is a question, especially millennials, you know, if you're 25, 30 years old now, you're going to say, what is this? You know, how come, how come we're so rich? You know, how come we didn't, we didn't think of that, you know? And, and my kids will say in 25 years, how come we didn't do anything about, uh, you know, the Alps going away, basically, here in Switzerland, you know, that's the same question. Yeah. But Garrett, let me let me also ask you to, to drill down a little bit on what the future of work might look like. Um, you know, obviously, it depends on what sector one's in. Maria has talked about people in the service sector, um, you know, in restaurants who are being innovative and and moving their their deliveries, you know, their their delivery to the roofs of garages and and sidewalks. Um, obviously, for those of us that that have office jobs. We're able to, to work remotely. We're able to use this technology um, in order to, to meet and convene and, and have conversations. But not everybody's able to do that. There are a lot of people who need to go to hospitals, right, particularly now because of the pandemic. Um, if you think about manufacturing, there are a lot of people who need to, to show up in order to produce things. Um, you've, you've talked, Garrett, a little bit about, you know, the impact of AI and, and technological advances. Um, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us about what the future of work might look like um, coming out of, of this current pandemic? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I, I made a movie in January called How the Future Works. Uh, and you can see it at howthefutureworks.tv. It's a short one, but 
basically the uh, the situation even before COVID was that uh, it's the end of routine. You know, machines are learning every, anything that's a routine, anything that's logical and commodity work. I used to call donkey work, you know, but it's not all donkey work, but anything that's kind of ongoing, just mechanical more or less. So part of that is things like call center or driving or even flying an airplane, but you know, it's all different levels of routines. Machines are going to learn every single routine as long as it does not involve any sort of human judgment values. And here's the rub, right? Uh, there's lots of studies showing 60 to 40, 60% of jobs can be automated, but they can't be completely automated. Uh, be because there's many components of routines that computers don't understand. Uh, it's because, because they don't know the context. You know, the AI didn't predict the pandemic. It, it was helpful in analyzing the data flow, right? It was quite helpful there, but it wasn't that uber brain that had it all under control. And, and, and this is because uh, machines don't know the values are not zeros and ones. You know, humans aren't, aren't data. You know, I don't, I don't believe that we are machines. There are people who would argue this. Right? So I believe what's happening with jobs is really quite simple. We're gonna give the commodity jobs and the routines to the machines, and then we're gonna elevate our work so that maybe we have to actually work less and make the mm -hmm. same money. Right? And you know, it's basically what I say, humanity on top of technology. And in order for that to work, we need to prep this place of you know, our skills, our human skills, we need protection of humanity, as I call it, yeah? like a theme park. <laughs> we need to protect our humanity so that we can actually remain on top of the machines. Yeah, but anyway, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about this. I don't think it, it is a disaster that automation will take all jobs away. I think that we have always had this. And my hope is that we can be wise enough to distribute the positive results of this in the future. And I think also, Quite clearly, we can see today, you know, as long as we're humans, which I think is going to be probably true for 30 to 50 years, if we choose so, uh, we're going to value relationships, yeah. experiences, and getting together and social, this is, our, this is how we are. Right? We're not just going to look into the camera all day and then be happy about that. Yeah? Uh, the future is going to be hybrid. We're going to do this, and then one day we'll just dine to get together and we're going to do that again. Uh, but we will not go back to doing commodity work by just going to an office and doing it there. You know? It's going to be a hybrid world. And just like in 10 years, people are saying 50, 60% of people are going to be freelancers working in the gig economy, working in the cloud. I mean, think about what kind of mindset you need for that. You know? But this, is, this makes me hopeful because I can say, okay, maybe in 10 years, we only work four hours a day. And that will be enough. I, I, I would add to that, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about jobs going away. There's, there's not as much talk about the new jobs that are going to be coming. Um, you know, all this technology, it will, it, will, um, it will take over some of the commodity jobs, yes, but there's also going to be new jobs formed. Uh, and, and it, you know, that could range from um, the, not just the designers of this technology, but the fixers of this technology. Um, one thing that we do know is um, we, we are continuing to run a shortage of, of science and technology students, particularly women and minorities. And we need that diversity in, in the developers of this technology. Um, you know, it can't just be developed by, you know, the, the um, Caucasian male or the male. Um, you know, we need to add diversity of thought in solving those problems and thinking about the second and third order consequences of this, these algorithms and the, the design of the technology. Um, we need people with different experiences coming to the table and, and you know, not just, you know, certain typical engineers. Um, so, so I also believe, you know, a, an impact on the future of work is going to be organizations are going to, are going to be investing differently into higher education and secondary education to influence their human capital supply chains um, into getting, you know, diverse talent um, that they need. And in, in addition to the technology talent, but also the humanities and uh, the different types of thinkers to help solve those problems. You know, there have been lots of articles about this lately about basically saying if we shift our resources 
towards a sustainable world, and that is healthcare and energy and, and everything else, we're going to create tens, if not hundreds of millions of jobs. Uh, shifting it away and, and automating the rest of it, we can create so many more new jobs. And, and uh, ultimately, I think our job, of course, science, technology and everything, but in 10, 15 years, I think our job, our ultimate job is to be human. Mm -hmm. right? Just to be human, to invent, to argue, to negotiate, to, inv to create, to imagine. We're going to have extremely smart robots that can build my website in 44 seconds, you know. Uh, that's already possible yeah? uh, using voice control and AI. So I think the good news is here, if we make the right decisions, we're going to create many, many new jobs. So what, you know, we don't have the, the 3 million people that work in call centers. Yeah? There'll be other things, you know. Uh, we used to have 90% of people in agriculture and now it's less than two and we're still working. <laughs> so I, I think that is entirely possible in, in a very hopeful perspective. I, I like that vision. Um, we're coming to the uh, to the end of, of our talk, and we certainly we just cannot talk about the future without talking about upcoming elections uh, in the United States and also in Germany and, and other countries in Europe. Uh, so you unfortunately you already explained to us that you cannot predict the future, <laughs> which of course we would have loved to ask you. Um, but you know, uh, and you just talked about the importance of getting together and you know things that remain. Now we have the party conventions, we have the Parteitage uh, in, in Germany, and uh, you know people cannot get together like they used to. Uh, we have a totally different campaign. Um, do you, how is the political landscape uh, changing and what are you, what's your imagination, sort of your vision of how this is all gonna, gonna play out? Maria, well, maybe, uh, you know, uh, the, in the United States, <laughs> it's more urgent than in Europe, but what? Well, be, <laughs> so being to, a good, being a good how do Swiss, we, how I mean, do we grapple with this? I'm actually a Swiss and German nationality now. I, I got my Swiss pa passport 10 years ago. <laughs> but so I speak with two tongues, if not a third tongue, which is Californian. But um, let's talk about America to make it brief. Uh, Trump will not survive this crisis and COVID spells the end of Trump, right? Because it, it is so apparent the uselessness of the, of the leadership in American government uh, even more so than before. And now we're coming to the point where I think this is the make it or break it point, And this is going to be a swing. I wrote about this the other day in my, on, on my blog is that we're, we're going to see a democratic president and probably a democratic Congress. So we're going to see a pivoting America next year. And that's both my hope as well as sort of my hunch. Uh, and of course, people would heavily argue with that uh, in terms of the, uh, the pushback about voting Trump again. But I think next year we're going to see America pivot and take a new role and the world will be a different place as a result of this, hopefully a positive new place. So, and I'll add to that. I mean, I, I believe no matter who wins the election that November, December are going to be filled with disruption. There's going to be um, controversy about election fairness in the United States and the results. So this is going to drive some economic instability, at least uh, in the short term following the election, as well as, you know, protests and societal disruption. So that to me is pretty clear. Um, I, I believe if Trump does win, and there is still a chance, um, if he does win, the country is going to continue to be polarized, and we're not going to see much progress, um, you know, in the next four years. Um, if Biden wins, um, you know, some signals to watch with the Biden administration would be, um, you know, early in the administration, does he work to heal uh, the, the fractures in our society in the United States? Does he, does he work to understand middle America and the middle class and um, really, you know, sort of have a little bit more centrist views? Or is he going to be leaning left and um, focusing more on the urban issues? And, and if that's the case, you know, we'll continue to be polarized, even with the new administration. Well, one more word on this. I think we may very well up with the Jacinda Ardern of America, that's Kamala Harris, uh, as the real president. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not unlikely. So uh, in Germany, for example, the elections, I think it's totally clear people are saying, does this candidate understand the future? Do they have a complex view of the world? Can they deal with complex issues? Can they break rules? This is why Merkel broke her rule, right? 
can they adapt? Adapt? Right? Do they have a collective mindset? And and these questions are being asked of every politician now, uh, regardless of which direction. And I, I think uh, populism is dead as a, as a result of uh, uh, of COVID, the COVID crisis because of the dismal performance and. I, I, also, that, oh. I was just going to say, we've seen that with parties on, on both sides of the Atlantic. But Maria, let me give you the last word. Oh, oh, I was going to add to the fact, um, you know, with the Biden administration, I think, you know, sort of building on what Gerd's last comment was, um, we will see him rely on um, leaders that are the best in their field. And he, he will build an administration that, that he relies on and he listens to. You know, he's not going to rule alone, which... Um, which hopefully will, you know, help make progress. Um. Well, Maria and Garrett, I, I want to thank you both for this incredibly thoughtful, but also very thought provoking and lively discussion. I've enjoyed it immensely. I think I speak for Katya and our viewers when I say that this has been um, a really good hour spent. Uh, I will, will go away thinking about a lot of the things that you've raised today. And on behalf of 1014 and the American Council on Germany, I just want to thank you both for this terrific conversation. Thank you for having me. I'd also like to thank our viewers um, for joining us today and for participating with some of your questions. Until next time, stay well, everybody. And thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>